It's a scary thing, guys, heading into maybe the last first law book ever. But you know what they say, it's better to do it than to live with the fear of it. Hey, what's up, bookworms and breakers and burners and all of the above? We are back today to talk a little more First Law as we are moving into, you guys, release day for the last book in the Age of Madness trilogy. This is, of course, Wisdom of Crowds by Joe Abercrombie, the ninth First Law novel. Now, this is a book that was sent to me uh, by Orbit US on the, on the urging of Mr. Joe Abercrombie himself. So I want to thank both Orbit and and Joe Abercrombie for giving me the opportunity to uh, review this book for him. All he asked for in return is an honest review, and you guys know I'm always going to do that. But let me tell you right up front, guys, spoiler warning here. I am not going to talk about anything that happens in this book. No spoilers whatsoever. However, I will be talking about events that happen in books one and two, and of course the original trilogy. Maybe. It's just stuff that I can't talk about what these characters are doing in a book three without talking about what they did in books one and two. So if you want nothing to know about the uh, the Age of Madness trilogy, I'd probably go ahead and turn back now and bookmark this. Come back after you finish the trilogy. But if you haven't read Wisdom of Crowds, you're perfectly safe. I'm going to tell you why I think you should or shouldn't read it, right? Now look, I love books one and two. But does this stick to landing? Well, we are going to talk about it by getting into first, guys. What? is it about the great change is upon us and some say that to change the world you must first burn it down now that belief will be tested in the crucible of revolution the breakers and burners have seized the levers of power and the smoke of riots has replaced the smog of industry and all must submit to the wisdom of crowds with nothing left to lose leo dan brock is determined to become a new hero for the new age while savine dan glockta must turn her talents from profit to survival before she can claw her way to redemption King Orso will find that when the world is turned upside down, no one is lower than a monarch. And in the bloody north, Rika and her fragile protectorate are running out of allies, while Black Holder gathers his forces and plots for revenge. The banks have fallen and the Son of the Union has been torn down. And in the darkness behind the scenes, the thread of the Weaver's ruthless plan are slowly being drawn together. And guys, that takes us into the end of the Age of Madness trilogy with the Wisdom of Crowds. Now, you guys know I am a big time fan of this series, but I'm going to be honest with you here. Not everything is good, but you know what? Most of it is. I almost got you there. Let's talk about what makes it good or bad. Like, good guys, it's an Abercrombie book, so it's always going to be about the characters. And the characters in this, I am happy to say, are as great as ever. I dare say that they are the best that they have been in this trilogy. The arcs for these characters do have a complete arc in this third book here. So I think you're going to be quite safe there. I can kind of talk about a little bit of the uh, seven, the development of the seven POV characters here because uh, they just continue to evolve. You know, Savine, she's got to face this uh, this new station in life and what to do with maybe, um, you know, having a second chance. You, know, you never know with the way that things ended. Uh, so she finds herself in a very, very different predicament that she did in books one and two. You know, I mean, we're dealing with trees in here, so life is going to be different. Or so did have mercy on apparently her, obviously, as he has a, a familiar relationship as well as, you know, some mixed emotions for her, obviously. And then we got, uh, you know, her, her husband, Leo Dan Brock. So uh, it's going to be a very, very tough time while dealing with treason and what kind of opportunity uh, Orso is going to give them. Is he just going to throw them in the dungeons? Well, we shall see Leo. You know, he is now literally and figuratively half the man that he used to be. And he's got to kind of decide on the lesser evil here on kind of what he wants to do, what he wants to do to, because he's uh, basically he's lived up to the reputation that his family name has, you know, by tre committing treason. So is he just going to kind of, just, is he going to wallow in his misery? You know, like I said, he's missing an arm and a leg at this point. What's he going to do with this new opportunity? Well, is there a new opportunity? What is Orso going to do with them? But uh, I, I will say that both Leo and uh, Savine have um, unexpected arcs in this book. Not as unexpected as the Trouble Peace, because the Trouble Peace completely blindsided me of what happened with these two. But with this one, uh, I think it's a kind of almost what you would expect in a way, but there are some twists and turns along the way. Gunnar Broad still very much uh, trying to decide you know, what he wants to do with his life here because he wants to do right, you know, by his family and get back to his family and stuff. But, you know, uh, the past is a sumbitch, you know, and trying to 
uh, deal with those things and his own personal demons, you know, that kind of really comes to a head in this one. And uh, it's something that is really, really well done. And uh, I'll talk about more a little bit later about maybe the conclusion of his arc. With Vic, you know, she's still trying to struggle with picking a side here on the great change. I mean, she's just one step behind Clover here on switching sides, I feel like. Uh, and this one, she's uh, she does pick a side, but then she's wondering, did I pick the right side or not? Basically, she's got to decide, you know, do I want to, you know, commit treason or do I want to die or both? You know, it's it's one of those kind of things. So it's, it's some tough decisions for Vic to make in this one. But again, like I said, with all these characters, I feel like their, their arc uh, from book one, you know, from, from a little hatred to now, they almost seem like completely different characters. And that's a good thing. Lots of development. Orso has to deal with, you know, being in the kingship when the kingdom is falling apart around him and try to figure out how do I fix this or is it beyond repair? And I just need to kind of let it burn. I mean, there's some tough choices. You know, obviously he was thrust into this way earlier than he expected. And he's not quite sure if he's being manipulated or not. But, you know, it's all going to come to a head in this one. And he makes some decisions in this that will sometimes have you being like, that is an awesome decision. And other times you'll be like, what are you thinking? So basically, he's going to be Orso in this book as well. But Clover always trying to struggle with what side he's going to be on. Uh, he starts to really question the fact. He always says, he, what side is he going to be on? He's going to be on the winning side, what he usually is. But he starts to question if that's the right thing to do. You know, is he trying to, at this late in life, is he trying to have a little bit of morals? You know, he's still, he's still kind of, uh, you know, haunted by what he did to Wonderful in a little hatred and things like that. And then, obviously, uh, what he did to Stour Nightfall in, in book two. So it's like one of those things now, it's like, uh, I don't think anybody trusts him. I don't even think he trusts himself. But uh, that all does really get a really sharp resolution here. Rick, uh, look, I, I don't know. He starts calling her Sticky Ricky, I think, to kind of say that's how what her name is pronounced like in this book. I think he actually started that in book two. I was saying Ricka in that first book, so I'm still saying Ricka. So if you're yelling at me, you're not saying her name right, well, that's fine. I don't audio, guys, so uh, that's how I read it. So I'm going to keep saying Ricka. Uh, she's striving for a way really to help achieve her father's dream of a united north. And uh, I think with, with her in this one, I, I think very much, guys, this is Ricka's book, I think. I feel like if A Little Hatred was Savine's book, and The Trouble of Peace was Leo's book. I very much feel like this one is Rick's book. Now, I feel like all these characters have their time and none of them feel kind of shrugged off. Because like in book two, I think Gunner really felt kind of like left in the dust somewhere. Uh, but this one, I feel like this really is Rick's taking the spotlight in this one. And her growth is fantastic. She's more than just a one-trick pony, which I might have kind of assumed uh, with a couple of ways. You know, she isn't just a, hey, let's just, let's just stab him. Let's just punch him in the face. She's actually quite calculating. And you learn lots more about the long guy in this. I know you guys are hoping about that. And that little prophecy, yeah, you're going to find out what it all is in this one. A big question that I'm going to get, and it's obviously something I think about, is what about the legacy characters, Mike? Is there any legacy characters? Yes, yes, there are. There's two of them in this book, all the way back from the Blade itself. So there are legacy characters in this. But again, guys, they are not the main players of this series. So I think if you're going into this hoping, okay, this is going to kind of be my reunion tour of the First Law Trilogy. No, this ain't it, guys. It still is very much about the new characters, and this is about the legacy characters passing that torch forward. And I'm happy to say, guys, he does it very well, because when I went into this book, I never, ever felt like, okay, when is Glockta going to show up? Uh, uh, is Gunner some descendant of Logan Ninefinger? I'm never doing that anymore. I am all aboard for these characters. Sure, I love seeing classic characters. I love seeing, you know, Brimmer Dan Gorst. I love seeing a lot of these characters that you feel like you want to see again. I love seeing that. But this is very much a story about these new characters. And I think I, I, I accepted that after Trouble with Peace. That's what this series was going to be. It wasn't going to be, like I said, a reunion tour, hanging out with your old drinking buddies. It really is very much about the kids. And I do feel like in this, uh, he really does fully pass the torch to the kids. They have the spotlight again here as the way it should be. And I think they're very well established all with the way that he builds them up. Now, those legacy characters do have their moments. Don't get me wrong. I think there will be some things there that will bring a little smile to your face more than once and maybe a tear to your eye. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe the best I have ever witnessed just like everything going to shit, everything just exploding into chaos on the ground level, just seeing when everything falls apart, that moment where everything just breaks. This is some of the best I've ever seen. It really feels so chaotic, so insane. You don't know what's going on. I mean, there is just 
you see that one gif of a, I think it's from, God, what was that show? I can't remember. Donald Glover walks in with two pizzas and the room's on fire. That's the first 50 pages, I think, of this book. Everything just pops off so, so quick. I was expecting a slow build in the first act of this. Not at all. He throws you right into the fire. Literally, you really do see everything just going crazy. Just descent into madness. And it happens so quick. I was actually stunned with some of the things that happened at the very beginning of this book. But I think that this book does a good job of asking the question of, are we replacing one tyrant with another? You know, what would you do if you were in that person's stead, the person that you're trying to get rid of on the throne? What would you do in that situation? And on paper, it might sound good, but when you're trying to act it out, does it go the way that you plan? Not usually. So it asks a lot of those good questions. But guys, I mean, the action, the betrayals, the politics, they are all up to the first law standards that we have come to expect from the series. And it is just some of the best. And yes, the prophecies and the theories that people have about characters. Look, you're going to get answers to them. I was right about two out of the three uh, the really big ones in there. If you don't know what those are, stay tuned for the spoiler talk I'm going to do for this. Let me let you guys know, October the 4th, Philip Chase and I are going to be doing the spoiler talk for Wisdom of Crowl. So stay tuned for that. Subscribe to his channel if you haven't. I'm actually excited for him to read it so I can talk to him about it uh, before then a little bit. But uh, this ties up everything in a really first law way. And what I mean by that is uh, not everything's happy. Some things end really sadly. Some things might feel like you didn't get what you were wanting, just like in the First Law Trilogy. It kind of has almost that same feeling. Now, I'm not saying it's a straight up copy with that. I'm just saying you're not going home with a big, neat, pretty little bow tied on everything and you know you feel like you're walking out of the theater after an MCU movie like ha ha ha. You know, you're going to still have like questions. You're going to get a lot of answers. You're still going to be like, but what about this? You're still going to be like, why did this have to happen? I mean, I think why is a question we've all been asking Joe Abercrombie for years, right? And you will be doing that with this one. Okay, guys. On to the bad here. And again, these are always subjective. I didn't necessarily find these bad, but there's some things that might uh, come up for some people as a, as a gripe. If this is the end of the First Law universe, there are still a ton of things that are unanswered. And in fact, he even opens up a new can of worms at the very end of this and then's like, see you later. Uh, look, when I talked to him in that interview, he really gave a non-answer. He really did about if he was ever going to write in this universe for all. The sense that I got... And I don't know the guy. I mean, I just talked to him for an hour and a half. Uh, but what I got out of that was he wants to write in a different universe for a while. But, you know, he could see himself easily sliding back into that familiar pair of sweatpants, which is the first law, and writing about it again. So uh, he definitely has left it open for that. But I think also he didn't because he kind of leaves it open in that way of our our. our are characters doomed to repeat history? He kind of leaves it that way. It could very much, the cycle could start to repeat with it, with the way that he ends it, but also in a way where you're like, okay, well, it's open if he wants to write more, and if not, you know, you can just assume that our characters did the right thing, right? And I don't know how good assuming does in the first law universe. Depending on your, uh, your, your, your favorites of the new characters, you might not like what happens to some of them in this. You might not like the resolution. You might not like the way that some of the arcs end. Like, for example, I didn't like the way that, that Gunnar Broad's arc ended at all. It was very unsatisfying. But again, I never expect a happy ending with all these characters. And that's not saying that uh, he met a fate worse than death, guys. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not telling you if any of these characters live or die. And yes, it's possible that none of them live, right? This is the first law book after all. Uh, that isn't what I mean by that. Just It was just very... I was like, I almost feel like he's, I can't say. I can't say, guys. Stay tuned for the spoiler talk, and I'll talk about it. Same with Vic. It was just kind of like, okay. Okay, but uh, yeah, there are some things that happen to some of the characters. I'm just like, ah, it sucks, but in the in that first law kind of way. So I can't really call it bad, but you will have some gripes maybe. And again, some things are left open and sad and just kind of unsatisfying. And I almost wish he hadn't kind of done the last Clover chapter that he did in this book because all it did was get the wheels turning for wanting the next trilogy, you know? And I think as a writer, that's that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to leave your audience wanting more. But uh, I think it's very much like that last argument of Kings where I was like, oh, but I, I don't want the story to end here. And I think that's good. I think that's, that is a good thing, but it's going to be some things that upset some people. So I will put it under the bed. Now let's talk about why I think that you guys should read it. In my opinion, there is nothing else in modern fantasy that touches the first law. 
I'm always going to stand for it because I think it is the best, most visceral, most realistic, most unique fantasy series going right now. It laps everything else in the genre and originality, character work, intrigue, all of the above. This very much continues that. And in some ways, it raises the bar even more. And if you've read this far, guys, I really don't see why you turn back now because you're going to get most of your answers. And the thing is, I don't want to say it's not going to give you answers. I feel like all the questions presented in this trilogy, you got answers. You just got new ones in this book that don't get answered. So I feel like I'm confusing people with that. I don't. I don't want to come off as deceiving. But uh, you just go in that with a with a you know an open mind, and I think you're going to like what you see. My final thoughts here is if when I talk when I talk to Joe, like I said, he I'm sorry about all the camera cuts, guys. I know it's not it's not usually like this for me. But if you could hear, I've got some. Thrud, some crud in the throat here and I can't even talk much less you know stop coughing so that's all the cuts anyways when I talked to Joe he did not answer like I said if this was the last first law book or not and uh look I was a little misty-eyed at the end not just because of what was happening for the characters but just kind of you know just a, a wave of nostalgia really this is a series that I have just been into for 13 years and you know I've, I've got nine books over that time so I can't really complain about it but it's just it just feels like the end of an era if this is really really it you know and it was just it was just it really hit me hard you know this is a series that i have adored that i have been an advocate for that i have pushed on friends and family and complete strangers for years now and i feel like i finally got a foothold on some of them uh some people like i said and some family members are like what the hell do you have me reading other people are like wow how have i never heard of this most people are like wow how have i never heard of this i love it and that makes me extremely happy so if this is the end i, I am very sad to see it go but if it really is i gotta say thank you to joe for such a wild, wild ride. I mean, this has basically become like a third of my life here is with these characters and with this universe. So it's, uh, I, I don't want to say it's like, hey, this is like Lord of the Rings was to my parents. No, probably not. Probably not. But I mean, this is my favorite modern fantasy series. And it's it's one that's always going to stick with me. This for me is like is like the, the Cosmere for other people or Wheel of Time for other people. This is my series. So seeing it possibly come to conclusion here uh it is really really sad and it's just like i said it's been a a wild ride that i will compare anything that i read going forward up to the standards that joe created here so thank you sir abercrombie you have done us quite a pleasure if i had to rank the new trilogy guys i think i would go number one trouble with peace i really love trouble with peace i put this one right behind it and then i put a little hatred third and here's the deal guys something's got to come in third it doesn't mean i didn't like a little hatred i like little hatred quite a bit it's just something has to come in third there you know so uh, i i'm really surprised at how much i love the trouble with peace because that was not where i thought the series was going at all but as this is a review for wisdom of crowds not the trouble of peace you can find that review if you want uh i'll say that's 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 how i'd rank them that's obviously not final it's really really new it could go any way in the future but as of right now that's where i stand but i did enjoy them all and yes i do hope that we get some more and he very much does leave that option open down the road so fingers crossed guys so Today is a day. Have you started reading? Have you? I mean, you probably started listening. Just about everyone I know that does this series like I do is obsessed with the audiobook. So they're probably audioing it right now. So you'll be done in a day or two, most likely. So I'd love you to drop in the comments and tell me what you thought. Let's try to keep the spoilers to a minimum for this book. Save those for the spoiler talk that I have with Philip, and uh, we'll do that then. But uh, I hope you guys love it like I did, and I can't wait to talk to you about it.